Hello, folks. Well, hasn't it been a long time? Um, actually, maybe four weeks, if I count right. My wife and I were able, thankfully, uh, blessed by our church to go on a couple of weeks of a holiday. We left on the 13th of May. And um, in the last four weeks, uh, my associate pastor, our associate pastor here, has been preaching through a, a sermon series, a four-week sermon series. So I thank you for your patience. Uh, we didn't put those uh, videos uh, of Pastor David's video uh, sermons on a video. You can find that at our website, redwateralliancechurch.org. Just look under, under uh, sermons, and you'll find the MP3 there, audio of those sermons, and worthwhile your time to listen to those. Again, thank you for inviting me into your um, places and spaces as we now move into uh, a new sermon series uh, in First Peter. And that's where we'll be spending the next little while. So I would encourage you to read First Peter uh, often and work your way through it on your own. And then that way you'll be better prepared. So why don't we begin? Oxford Languages defines exile as, quote, the state of being barred from one's country. So in other words, if you and I are exiled, this means we must leave where we are and not return. Furthermore, when we think about this, along with forced exiles, uh, there are those who freely choose to leave their home, their country, their place of living, and remain in exile somewhere else. Now, let's take a look at a famous example of a forced exile, and we find one in the life and times of Napoleon Bonaparte. Maybe you guys are familiar with his story a little bit. You know, we know that Bonaparte was uh, finally defeated once for all at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. And this, of course, would cause uh, Bonaparte to no longer be the emperor uh, that he said he was, and he would have to surrender the British. And we find that uh, the British decided they didn't want to make Bonaparte a, a martyr if they executed him. So they exiled him to what was, what was at the time one of the most isolated places on planet Earth. St. Helena in the South Atlantic uh, Ocean. And four years later, Napoleon Bonaparte, once emperor of Europe and, uh, and many other things that he did and accomplished, died on May 5th, 1821, at the age of 51. Now, on the other side of the same coin, consider me, if you, consider, pardon me, it's been a while since I talked to a video or a camera, consider, me, consider with me... Um, a few examples of voluntary exile. We have Ernest Hemingway, you might have heard of him, was sent to France one time on behalf of Toronto Star. And Hemingway there fell in love with the expat culture and then on a self-imposed exile state in Paris. And there was another fellow too by the name of Albert Einstein, I'm sure you're familiar with him, who was a self-proclaimed pacifist. Uh, Einstein hated war and I don't blame him and he hated violence and he hated armies. And in early 1930s, Einstein left Nazi Germany on a self-imposed exile to the United States. Well, let's fast forward to the 21st century and to some comments Pastor Alistair Begg uh, made, uh, writing in April 2021 for Gospel, the Gospel Coalition. He said this concerning present-day Christian believers. He said, quote, For us in the English-speaking West, this world has tended to feel very much like home, and our treasures have been right before our eyes, right? end of quote. Now we're going to go back in time again to the first century, and we see there the Apostle Peter, one of the very first followers of Jesus Christ, would go on to write two inspired letters. In the introductory comments of his first lever, letter, lever, pardon me, letter, we discovered who he was writing to. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, to those who are, are elect exiles of the dispersion. So who were these exiles that Peter was writing to? Why was Peter inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this letter? There are many and many other questions that are before us as we begin our study of 1 Peter. As I alluded to or I said earlier, we're entering a new sermon series and we're calling it A Living Hope. So please turn in your Bibles. Uh, to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read the complete chapter. Um, hopefully you can still see me here on the side of the video. We're going to read the complete chapter um, for context. Just give us some context. So 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 1. Peter, 
an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. <clears throat> though you do, not, you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy, that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds to conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed for the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Verse 20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass wither and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together. We look forward to this uh, sermon series. Uh, we ask, Lord, by your spirit that you would help us be prepared. And, and week by week here as we go through this letter. And Lord, help, help us to be receptive as your Holy Spirit teaches us and molds us and shapes us. Uh, to be more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, because that is the goal of our lives that you have put into us by your spirit. We thank you, Lord, and I thank you for all those who are listening. Bless them and keep them uh, close to your heart. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, friends, as we begin our study of 1 Peter, let's just start by, you know, setting a bit of the scene, a little bit of background context. We want to do that as well. And if find any other possible features that we could highlight at the beginning of our series today. First, we, we notice the author of the letter is identified himself as Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's in verse 1. So I asked the question, or we asked the question, who is this Peter that called himself an apostle of Jesus Christ? Now, some might be thinking, come on, pastor, this is Peter. You know that Peter, the one Jesus himself chose to be a disciple? Of course, I would agree with you. However, when we do Bible study, we, will, we always want to be diligent. We want to be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, who received the Apostle Paul's words and then with all eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so, Acts 17, 11. And I want to give you an example 
from our time, our day, in the Christian culture, why we want to carefully examine when anyone claims, as the CSB uh, study notes highlights, to be a divine, quote, a divinely ordained, directly commissioned, authoritative representative of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, end quote. And this is what Peter is doing here in our text. So we're going to the area of the Mount Juliet area of Tennessee. I'm not very familiar with that area. You might be. And there you'll find the Global Vision Bible Church. Now, Global uh, is under the leadership of Greg Locke and his uh, wife, who co-pastor the church. Now, Locke himself, uh, if you've been tracking at all with this, uh, his story uh, or what he's been doing, and if not, I'll just share some of those things. Uh, over the past decade, Locke has become one of the most controversial pastors in the United States. Locke has now transitioned, had transitioned at one point from becoming the outspoke, outspoken in political views toward the more hyper-charismatic arm of the church, and, and specifically deliverance ministry. And now from the deliverance ministry, Locke, uh, just at least a week ago, or maybe even less, or maybe longer, I'm not quite sure of the exact date, it's recently anyways, uh, Locke, a few days, uh, a little while ago, at Global Church, along with his wife, were installed as apostles to the nations. And I want to be clear, because I watched the installation, on, obviously on, online, and uh, to be clear, when Locke was installed, he was seen and understood to be and appointed as one like the Apostle Peter, who was, according to CSB notes, quote, divinely ordained, directly commissioned, and an authoritative representative of the Lord Jesus himself, end quote. So the question is, Locke an apostle, divinely ordained, commissioned, and an authoritative representative of Christ? Well, the short answer is, either Locke is in serious error, and, uh, or seriously, he is a false disciple or a false apostle. And my friends, that is why we need to study the Bible carefully. We need to be diligent. And it is a fair and good question to ask, who is this Peter that called himself an apostle of Jesus Christ here? Verse 1. I'll be appealing, of course, to CSB notes and, uh, and a few commentaries. I'll kind of put it all together. I want to give them the credit. But uh, using their material, we'll try and put it together, and then we'll see what these two, ver particularly verse 1 and 2, are telling us about this letter and about Peter himself. I'll be focusing there in verse 1 and 2. We see from within the letter, when we read the whole letter together in context, we will find in the letter support that Apostle Peter is the author. We see Peter here in his letter describing Christ's crucifixion with the kind of intimate knowledge that only really a true disciple would have experienced of the event. We'll go to chapter 2, verse 21 to 24. And we read that together. Chapter 2, verse 21 to 24. Peter said, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. There's an example of someone here in Peter's letter that knew these intimate details of, of Christ's crucifixion. We go to chapter 5, verse 1, and we see Peter describing himself as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ. He was actually saying he was there. And when we look at the language throughout Peter's letter, you know, he uses language that alludes to his personal experience with Jesus Christ. For example, in chapter 5, verse 2, Peter exhorts the elders to shepherd the flock of God that is among you. This is alluding to Jesus' charge to Peter in John chapter 21, verse 15 to 17. Why don't we turn there? John chapter 21, verse 15 to 17. John chapter 21, verse 15 to 17. Verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, 
feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Back in chapter 5, uh, Peter commands in chapter 5, verse chapter 5, verse 5b, he commands, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Here, Peter, possibly recalling the event where Jesus washed the disciples' feet in John's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 2 to 17. I'll leave you that reference. You can check that out for yourself. Additionally, in there are several themes in 1 Peter that can be found in Peter's sermons in the book of Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles. We go to chapter 1, verse, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Let's read that together, verse 21. Actually, go back to verse 20. We'll get some little context there. He who was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, verse 21 now, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. We can compare this with Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. Please turn there, Acts chapter 2. We're flipping around a lot today, so I know that I'm probably going faster than, than you are. Acts chapter 2, verse 32 to 36. Verse 32 to 36. Acts chapter 2. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, and until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Moving in the second chapter of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, Peter said, So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who don't believe, uh, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. Again, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Here, Peter is alluding to his comments in Acts chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. I'll kind of wait till you catch up there a little bit. Acts chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Verse 10 and 11. Acts chapter 4. Actually, just go 11 and 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Verse 11, this Jesus is a stone that was rejected by you, the builders which have become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Flip back to 1 Peter. So, in summation, my friends, when Peter introduced himself here at verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, the internal evidence of the letter provides more than enough proof that Peter was writing his letter as the CSB notes suggested, quote, divinely ordained, directly commissioned, and an authoritative representative of the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, but we can put it this way. Peter was a big A apostle. Peter was selected, appointed, anointed, empowered, and commissioned by Jesus Christ himself to be one of the 12 apostles who, according to the apostle Paul, are the foundation of the household of God, with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 through 22. Apostle Peter, write, Apostle Peter pardon me, writes his letter with the authority given to him by Christ under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And tragically, men and women like Greg Locke and his wife, who will lead many astray, I am sure, will stand before Jesus Christ one day to give an account for their error, their deceit, and even sadly, their lies. But moving along, I would encourage you to read through Peter's letter, often over the course of our study. Here is a question 
that I want to present to you. Maybe you can find this as you study yourself as well. If there's a theme or themes that stand out in Peter's letter, there are a number of them. There are, are sort of themes at the surface and themes under the surface. And as you study this letter, you'll find rising to the surface an emphasis on Christian suffering. Uh, that is, suffering is normative for believers, normative for you and me as it was for those in the first century. You can expect it. Suffering will come your way as a believer and you will be hard-pressed to avoid it. We get our first clue that Christian suffering is a prominent theme of Peter's letter, beginning with Peter's description of his audience. Verse 1, they are the elect exiles of the dispersion. Now, we'll get deeper into what this phrase means as, and the implications for you and me as we move through our study, but suffice it to say that the Apostle Peter here emphasizes the believers' suffering was because they were temporary residents of this world. So, that the, so in other words, the what has been answered. Christian suffering is normative. And in one short phrase, we have answered the why. Christians suffer because this world is not their home. Christians are temporary residents of this world. This is a general statement, of course. We'll see more of this as we begin our study. So let's recap really quick here. Pardon me, really quick. One more time, the author of 1 Peter is none other than the Apostle Peter, who was, I want to sound like a broken record, divinely ordained, directly commissioned, and authoritative representative of the Lord Jesus himself. But we want to move along. Peter's letter, when we look at it in the context of the New Testament itself, is what is called a general letter. Peter was not writing to a specific church or a person, like, for example, Paul's letter to Corinthians or Paul's letter to Titus. Peter was writing to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, verse 1. Peter was writing to believers in five different Roman provinces, which is present-day Turkey. This brings up another question. Who are these elect exiles, or these pilgrims, as the New King James Version uh, translates to Greek? The original meaning of the Greek word, so let's look at that word. The original meaning of that Greek word, exile, carries a sense of one who is a sojourner, a person who comes from a foreign country into a place, a land, a country, in a temporary way. And these sojourners are of the dispersion. And this word dispersion is translated in ESV and probably even your uh, translation is translated from the Greek word diaspora. Now that we know this, what do we do with it? Remember, folks, that when we study the Bible, uh, there's a number of principles that we need to put into play in order to get the meaning and the application of any given text for us today. We have another print. Uh, okay, and so far before I jump ahead to this other, other principle. And so far, uh, we have been careful to use the number one rule, which I like to share, context, context, context. But there's another principle to consider. We need to remember that we're 21st century citizens living in the Western world. And the authors of the New Testament books, like 1 Peter, are first century citizens living in the ancient Near East. They would not think or act like you and me. So if we're to really get to the nitty-gritty of Peter's letter, specifically though verse 1 and 2, we have to put on our first century hats, our first century glasses, so to speak. We need to think and act like Peter and ask, what principles did Peter apply to his letter? You know, as, one, as you read through the New Testament books, we find that the New Testament authors use images and metaphors and concepts and language that was applied to the covenantal people of Israel, that is, the people of God under the old covenant. Israel, chosen by God, as Moses would tell us in Deuteronomy 14, 2, of Israel, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession, out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Well, back here in 1 Peter, we find that Peter takes this image, this kind of language of Old Covenant Israel, and applies it to the New Covenant community, the church. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Let's read that together. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Do you see the language there? 
See, what Peter was doing here as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, by using these images and this language from the Old Testament, was establishing the new covenant community, the church, as the chosen people of God. As one commentator put it, Peter in his letter established, quote, the Christian community as the chosen people of God, the true Israel of God, end quote. And not only did Peter apply this to those he addressed as exiled, but by including the term diaspora, translated in the ESV here, dispersion, and by virtue of the new covenant, the real diaspora is no longer the Jewish people, it is the new community of Christian believers that were scattered throughout the world in the first century, and we can apply that directly to our world today, the 21st century context. Christians scattered throughout the world today. And these, my friends, are the exiles that Jesus, when he prayed his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, would point to. Peter, uh, Jesus prayed, I, did, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in uh, the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. John chapter 17, verse 14, 15, 18. So here's the point, my friends. The Apostle Peter has clar had clarified what Jesus prayed about in the presence, not only of Apostle Peter, but all the 12 apostles. When Peter speaks in regard to exiles, these are Christians who have been called to be in, but not of the world. These are Christians who are engaged in the world, but with the awareness that they're not completely at home. Indeed, my friends, they are sojourners. Indeed, my friends, we are sojourners. Their home is elsewhere. Your home is elsewhere. And they are temporary residents of the world. And you are temporary residents of this world. And this theme in Peter's letter of exile or sojourning is tied to another familiar theme of the Old Covenant Jewish people. Not only are Christians exiles, they are notably the elect exiles of God. Chosen by God to be his own people, just as he chose Israel. Moses again helps us, for you are people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the people on the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 7, 6. Here at verse 2, Peter highlights the choosing of the new covenant believers with three prepositional phrases. And here's the choosing of the new covenant believers in the first phrase, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And so the election of the believers, first century, 21st century, and everywhere in between, is grounded in the mystery of God's divine foreknowledge and his eternal sovereign purposes. And this divine election is done in the sanctification, sanctification of the Spirit. Here's a second prepositional phrase. Then Peter points to God's goal for uh, his elect exiles who are sanctified, that is, made holy by the Holy Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling uh, with his blood. Peter, Peter reminding his audience that through the sacrifice of Christ, two important realities are now realized in the new covenant community. Sins are removed and forgiven once for all and a pledge is then given to live a life of obedience to God. Well, friends, I think we'll stop here. So a brief summary, the Apostle Peter is writing to believers living in various places of the first century Roman Empire. Believers faced with persecution and alienation for their allegiance to Jesus Christ. The reality is this, Christians will suffer for their faith in Christ. Yet Peter reminds them that they are not citizens of this world, they are sojourners. And more importantly, they have been chosen by God himself to be his holy possession. As Peter stated so well in verse, chapter 1, verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And friends, even the trials and tribulations have a purpose, according to Peter, who says so that the test of genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7 to 9. And here we see the Apostle Peter's letter comes from the heart of one who knew intimately the trials for his faith and trust in Jesus. 
and one day he will be crucified for his faith in Christ. The Apostle Paul, Peter writing a letter of affirmation and encouragement to those who needed a reminder that God had called them, sanctified them, saved them, and was with them in their suffering. I want to remind us as we wind this up here uh, regarding the quote from Alistair Begg. He said, For us in the English-speaking West, this world has tended to feel very much like home, and our treasures have been right before our eyes. Can I ask you, do you feel this world is your home? How about Begg's other point? Are those things that we treasure the most right before our eyes here now? How about this? When you struggle and face uh, various kinds of sufferings, maybe even for your faith in Christ, where do you turn? Do you turn to Facebook, social media, CNN, CBC, CTV? Psychologists, where do you go? What do you do with your pain and your suffering? You know, friends, as we continue to study First Peter, we will be challenged and confronted, and I believe comforted as well. You see, we are not supposed to settle down here on this world. Christian are, Christians are sojourners. And two, contrary to the majority of you, it seems these days, of the North American Christian culture, we are not to expect the church to be respected, to be accepted, or to be influential in our secular society. I want to leave you uh, with uh, words from 1 Peter, Peter and, and verse 3 to 5 of chapter 1, uh, as I close. Remember, folks, the, name, the, the, the title of our sermon series is A Living Hope. We have a living hope, and this is how Peter put it. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for our salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I pray and hope that encourages you if you're struggling in whatever way, shape, or means today, even for your faith in Christ. Let us pray together. Father, I thank you. I thank you for First Peter. And I just want to close by committing this time to you and my friends, my brothers and sisters, and anyone else that's listening to you. Oh, Lord, may they turn to Christ. May they receive Christ. May they walk in the ways of Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Shalom.